why don't we get started? Um, so uh, to just to, to introduce um, uh, this, so just to remind everybody, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'm, I'm recording the session. Um, so, uh, and uh, uh, so, so, so anyways, uh, my name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center um, here at Western Washington University. Um, the, uh, the ISC aims to foster an interdisciplinary approach to the, to the study and design of digital technology. And the lecture series is uh, presenting leading scholars and practitioners whose work sort of challenges and extends uh, our understanding of digital technology and its place in the world. And Ian's work certainly does that. Um, Ian uh, Vojtovich is an artist living and working in Vancouver. He uses design techniques and public interventions to provoke discussions of, of issues around structural violence, prejudice, cultural reconciliation, and democratic agency. Uh, his projects um, have been shown at the, uh, the International Symposium for Electronic Arts, uh, or ART, uh, SIGGRAPH, uh, MIT Media Lab, Harvard University, and he's lectured at the New School, Carnegie Museum of Art, California College of Arts, the Carnegie Mellon University, and the Pollen Museum uh, of the History of Polish Jews and the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. His projects have been featured in Wired Magazine, Atlantic Monthly, and he has taught at uh, Emily Carr University of Art and Design. And he holds a master's degree in art, culture, and technology from MIT's School of Architecture. So, so with that um, impressive introduction, uh, Ian, uh, let me set it up so that you can share your screen. I assume you, you have some, some slides you want to show us. So yeah. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Um, so here, let me... Uh, uh, I take over here. I got share screen. There we go. Nice. Okay. So <clears throat> let's see. Does that give you a full screen view of a book on a tabletop? Uh, it's black now, but we saw it just a second ago. Oh, really? Um, how about now? Still nothing. Uh, okay. Yeah, still nothing probably sharing the wrong screen. So let's see. Right. Oh, you see it now. All right. So um, let's try this again. Share. Let's share the whole desktop. It's probably the problem. Um, okay. How's that? Great. Okay, good. Okay, well, thanks. Um, thanks, Dustin. Thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with uh, your class today. Um, I, um, this is going to be a talk mostly about other people's work. Um, I've just recently signed a publishing contract with MIT Press to um, put together a book about interrogative design, um, which is a, uh, an approach to public art and design uh, coined by uh, the artist Christoph Fedichko um, back in the 90s. And uh, um, it's been the subject of uh, his, his teaching and his practice, uh, arts practice for, um, for a few decades now. And, and a number of uh, artists have, and designers have taken it up um, in their own work. Um, and so I'm trying to coalesce uh, those ideas into a, a volume that's going to be uh, edited by me. I'm going to do some writing. Um, there's going to be a lot of work of other people and, and the writing of other people. So if you'll bear with me, um, this is a very, I haven't presented uh, anything about the book uh, before outside of our small group of contributors. So this will be pretty rough, um, but I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, Dustin, just for uh, a some context your students are mostly comp sci students is that correct uh it's a it's a mix fairly interdisciplinary so some computer science students and then we have students from across uh, uh the campus from design majors as well yeah. okay great um and your your class is mostly on uh it's on media media arts and design 
Um, well, this lecture right. series is is pretty pretty diverse. We have spe okay. this quarter we've had quite a few um, sort of projects and, and and speakers that have to do with sort of media arts and, and design, um, but. Uh, uh, you know, sort of past quarters have been focused on more sort of critical technology studies. It's been a, it's been a mix. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> so I have a rough plan, which is um, uh, I'm going to um, kind of uh, I'm going to read a s chunk of the introduction, uh, which is going to be painful for you, but I'm going to put you through it, and um, and then I'm going to um, uh, sort of go through. Uh, Sort of a light, a light uh, tour through most of the content of the book as it stands now. And you'll see a lot of uh, images of projects uh, and a variety of ideas. And hopefully, you'll leave it with some sense of what interrogative design is or could be, um, and what uh, you know. And hopefully, some of that will be useful to you. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and read a couple of pages, and then I'll uh, I'll get into a more of a, a, a free form presentation and. Feel free to stop me at any point with questions. I'm totally happy to, to make this a conversation. Um, <clears throat> uh, human activity is progressing towards a strange new horizon that once seemed solely the province of science fiction. Uh, at the time of this writing, news reports of uh, advances in autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, bioengineering, humanoid robotics, 3D holographic displays, flying cars, and space travel now seem like a daily occurrence, reinforcing William Gibson's dictum that uh, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. We seem to be living in an environment that is collapsing the future into the present, and these new conditions bring with them new social, political, and biological realities that are difficult to predict. Where are these trends taking us? What are their unseen costs? Are we equipped for these new situations? Are we even equipped to think about them? Some of the consequences of new technologies uh, are obvious. They offer us speed, comfort, convenience, and a sense of control, entertainment, and wonder, but unexpected problems have begun to emerge as societies adopt them. George Will wrote, the future has a way of arriving unannounced. Pandemics such as COVID are a clear example, um, but there are others as well. Wealth inequality is increasing within countries, even though it is decreasing between them. This inequality has driven a host of social problems from health to crime, cell phone use in children is causing noticeable developmental problems. Social media has precipitated a variety of mental health problems in adults. Climate change threatens dramatic loss of ecosystems and forced migration of massive numbers of people around the world. Nuclear weapons threaten the planet with horrifying catastrophe. Smaller scale wars and bitter conflicts continue to erupt around, erupt around the world um, <clears throat> with, the regu with uh, regular targeting of civilian populations by both state and non-state actors using continuously evolving techniques. Technological and economic change have precipitated a regression to nationalist politics via massive growth in public misinformation and covert propaganda, a kind of weaponizing of the internet. The co-development of biotech and information technology is leading to what Yuval Harari calls the hacking of the human being which may endanger individual free will and the future of democracy and liberty across the world. The blind spots and rhetorical momentum of our media are major contributors to these problems. We are unable to generate effective public uh, discourse about the problems that face us. Thomas uh, Homer Dixon calls this problem the ingenuity gap and increasing inability of our societies to address the complex is issues of the 21st century. <clears throat> Despite the nature of these concerns, we seem to be doubling down on existing techniques to reason our way out of them. 
Western societies try to understand our various dilemmas through television talk shows, web-based magazine articles uh, that most <laughs> readers never even finish, um, the, uh, and academic uh, journal articles written and reviewed by small numbers of experts and locked away behind expensive paywalls. New technological environments call for new approaches to collective thought, ingenuity, ingenuity and empathy. One avenue of possibility is the idea that crowdsourcing and social media platforms will provide much needed cognitive amplification to solve some of these new dilemmas, yet there is mounting evidence that these systems may be making our situation worse. Jaron Lanier describes social media as a manipulative technology with the aim of creating addictive behavior. Authors such as Nir Ayal have uh, have created how-to guides for technology designers to trigger, uh, to build uh, effectively Pavlovian loops <clears throat> that keep users dependent, maximizing income uh, for digital media companies. Um, it's interesting to note that Nir Ayal also uh, wrote a, a sequel to his book, which um, uh, trying to uh, provide a kind of solution for the for the reverse or to help help people out of this um, conundrum. Um, these are not uh, platforms for critical thinking so much as media for compulsive consumptive behavior and data mining. Most of our complex social problems have been addressed by academics and individuals using the old techniques of print media communication. Books have long provided the central medium for recording and transmitting complex thought and conducting intellectual debates. Every time you go to a source, uh, this is a quote, every time you go to a source for information, you renew a relationship between readers and writers that may be centuries old. Yet it seems that uh, efficacy of long form reading itself is in decline. Screen-based media seems, seems to have reduced society's ability to, to sustain the prolonged attention necessary to delve deeply into complex topics. Our changing cognitive environment calls for new approaches to intellectual inquiry. We need to consciously design our way through these new socio-technical conditions uh, and, and new cognitive tools can help us look at various challenges in, in new ways. By modifying the technological apparatuses that surround us, artists and designers can play a vital role in transforming how we perceive critical problems, how we perceive critical problems, and ultimately how we think through them. Interrogative design is an approach that provides critical orientation, design principles, and communication techniques that can open up new avenues for questioning, debate, and conceptualizing difficult topics. So what is uh, interrogative design? On one level, interrogative design is a way of designing unusual objects that stimulate public discourse. It promotes the ability of artists to generate wider discussion on topics that receive little attention through market forces. Interrogative design helps uh, spur society to think through um, complex topics where traditional media and mainstream public education fail. The design projects influenced by this technique are formally unusual and, awfully, and, and often unsettling. They resonate with initial meaning, yet leave their audiences in an unresolved state that asks them to participate in subsequent stages of meaning making. Interrogative design seeks to provoke viewers to produce more novel questions. The Originator of interrogative design, Krzysztof Wodiczko, uh, was trained as an industrial designer in Poland in the 60s during communism. As prog his uh, progression from uh, commercial practitioner to uh, artist and social commentator was shaped by the political environment that was, uh, that was highly aversive to dissent, uh, yet much in need of it. 
As a professional industrial designer at UNITRA in Warsaw, uh, <laughs> sorry, that's, uh, that's an emergency test on my, uh, on my cell phone. Um, I, I guess uh, a part of our BC, British Columbia emergency te uh, test system. Okay, so um, uh, are you guys still with me or have I lost you completely? No, 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 that was, yeah. that was great. Excellent okay. timing with the yeah, uh, right? alarm. Yes, excellent, okay. So um, let me just uh, go back a sentence. So as a professional industrial designer at UNITRA in Warsaw, uh, Vodichko designed common electronic product, products, including, among other things, um, uh, optics and a public address speaker system for use in offices and factories. Um, excellent timing. Um, one of his uh, earliest subversive creations was in this context, in this professional context, where he managed to um, quietly include an off switch in these speaker boxes, boxes, these wall-mounted speaker boxes, without raising the attention of the communist censors. So this small feature provided a wide public with the uncommon luxury of being able to switch off uh, public announcements in the totalitarian communist state. <clears throat> Outside of his professional context, his Early artistic works included rhetorical vehicles, um, such as Poyast One, in which the single driver would pace back and forth on a platform in contemplation, causing a tilting mechanism to transform the ship's shifting weight into a forward driving momentum. Only by pacing back and forth could you move. Such a non-statement was both safe from censorship and yet sent a clear message about the potentially subversive act of free thought in a totalitarian regime. Uh, Vodichko's political thought pieces continued after his emigration to Canada and then the US where he can, uh, eventually produced one of his best known works, The Homeless Vehicle. The project shown, uh, shown here is uh, on the surface an attempt to solve homelessness through the creation of a custom designed cart for itinerant people to live in. However, it was motivated uh, more precisely by an interest in questioning the very conditions that give rise to homelessness. The project sought to create a, an almost absurdist solution so as to provoke inquisitiveness and protest, directing attention to a deeper discussion of the issue as a whole. Let's run you through a, a few of these images. Um, he, and this is just a side note from what's written in the introduction here, but um, he, he worked collaboratively with uh, homeless people uh, in New York in the late 80s to, to design this, uh, this vehicle, uh, interviewing them in length about their needs and requirements, uh, what they would want in, uh, in a vehicle that they could use uh, for homeless living. Uh, and they um, told him about a variety of needs for um, for a safe sleeping space, uh, security for their belongings, a place to wash up uh, and go to the washroom. Um, so this, for example, this is the cap to the, um, to the homeless vehicle, which doubles as a sink. Uh, you can see it sort of extends into a sleeping space and there's a lockable storage unit underneath. Um, so this is um, a work of industrial design, but it also drew a great deal of uh, attention here. You can sort of get a sense for the different um, sort of operating um, modes that the uh, the device could work in. Um, but it also created a kind of a public spectacle and and uh, acted as, a, as a, a mediating device between the lives of homeless people in the city who are normally invisible to most of the um, uh, other citizens of the city um, and became a a way of, of bridging contact or, or initiating contact between um, 
citizens, the rest of the citizens and the homeless citizens of the city, um, where they could begin to tell their stories uh, through the, the device itself. It uh, generated a fair amount of press. Um, this is the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, got a notable uh, article in uh, the Wall Street Journal, including an engraving, uh, which is, uh, uh, you got to be pretty uh, special to get an engraving in one of your articles, and that, that was notable. Um, and uh, it was also featured in a, a Canadian um, National Film Board documentary, um, which had this really nice moment in it where the director uh, interviewed um, Eric Roth, who is the director of the Bowery Mission in New York, um, which is in charge of or uh, takes on a lot of uh, homeless advocacy and, and shelter um, uh, uh, charity work. And his response to the project is fan fantastic. Uh, and it really shows how interrogative design works. So he, he was interviewed about Christoph's um, homeless vehicle. And he said, I find the concept offensive. To me, I understand it's a prototype for uh, not for mass production, but it's uh, but it's something to be used to initiate discussion. But the discussion I want to contribute is that I think it's offensive uh, that such substandard housing should be inst uh, should be institutionalized in some way, and that we should consider housing people at a level um, at that level as even a partial solution to homelessness. The solution is not sh uh, cardboard shacks or cardboard shacks on wheels. The real solution is, is uh, housing. Um, and, and, he, and he goes on to describe what, um, um, what he thinks. He says this, well, assuming that Christoph is a talented artist who cares to apply his art to the problem of homelessness, poverty or hunger, there is a lot of productive ways to do it that are not so attention getting as designing a homeless vehicle for people to live in, but they're much more pragmatic and, sh and could very much impact the functionality of homes like this one in serving the homeless. Um, this is, so there are two things here. One is his kind of um, intense reaction to the artwork. And the other is that um, basically saying that artists um, should not use their energies for doing this sort of thing, but should a better use of it would be to actually volunteer or or create the the actual solutions. Don't make art; make the real thing. Um, and this is this is really important. Uh, this crops up again and again in social practice art, um, and it's also key to interrogative design. So, Christoph's response was was also interesting. He said. Uh, uh, all of these things that uh, Eric Roth uh, is saying are, are true. In fact, I would be saying the same things. The problem is what he is not saying. My project is submerged in many doubts and uncertainties I have. I think his reaction is also part of my project. It is exactly the impossibility of this project and the horrifying absurdity that perhaps this kind of project is needed not as a solution or temporary solution. The project itself, the design articulates the situation further than the existing habitat that the uh, evicts uh, developed. The, the project exaggerates, pushes uh, even further, exactly to the point of a very dark and frightening absurdity. Of course, the vehicle must be rejected. That is one of its purposes. In the process of being rejected, it brings more information and confronts the non-homeless, providing the possibility for direct dialogue, discussion about the program of this vehicle. This vehicle is inconvenient, disturbing for everyone, because it looks as it, uh, as it is well-designed and looks uh, as, as though this is the way it should be. And yet, at the same time, it is obvious that this is exactly what this should not be. That's the contradiction that this vehicle proposes, and that's the most disturbing aspect of it. Um, so this starts to point at, uh, at why I asked Dustin to, um, to title the speech uh, Design with No Solutions. So um, <clears throat> key to interrogative design is, that I, is the idea of pushing back on design's impulse to solve things. Um, and so interrogative design is a is an approach to design where uh, creating new questions is more important than, um, than uh, creating a viable solution. Um, and I'll get into that in a moment. 
Um, let me just. Um, I'm going to read just a couple more pages from the intro because that'll be useful. Um, also, how are we doing for time? Because I didn't really look at when we started. We're good. We, we started at, at noon, so you're, okay. you're, you're good to go. Keep going. Um, <clears throat> Um, so as Christoph's approach to design evolved through fur further projects, uh, he eventually put his ideas to paper in a 1994 essay entitled Interrogative Design. Uh, his thinking was influenced by um, uh, thinkers such as Foucault and Brecht. Um, the former explored the nature and importance of fearless speech in producing a healthy democracy. The latter described a new form of theater that sought to jar its audiences out of the hypnotic slumber of romantic storytelling illusions through the techniques of interruption and alienation. Art, according to Brecht, should produce thought, not numbness. Later, Vodichko would be influenced by the writing of Chantal Mouffe, who formalized the idea of agonistic democracy. Agonism, as explored in, in, the, in the book, um, suggests that uh, a thriving democracy uh, does not come about by organizing around deliberative consensus building processes, but uh, rather it envisions a more open sphere of ongoing contention and opposing interests, never resolved, always shifting and transforming. Mufsi's argument and disagreement as more important to democracy than collective harmony and collaborative um, consensus. Vidichko and other artists influenced by, the, uh, by his method have achieved um, considerable public media attention and positive critical academic recognition for their, uh, for their work from art, design and new media communities. Vidichko himself represented both Canada and Poland at the Venice Biennale um, and I should just mention that he's now an American citizen and based in New York and, and Cambridge and teaches at Harvard. Um, uh, he was the recipient of the Hiroshima Art Prize in recognition for his work uh, towards world peace. Vodichko describes interrogative design in his own words. He says, interrogative design includes the performative use of specially designed communicative equipment. These projects' purpose is to inspire and assist people who choose to take part in them to become present day Parisiastes, free, fearless speakers and social agents. By extension, the aim of these projects is to contribute to the process of animating the city as a site of agonistic public discourse and dynamic democratic process. The topics of performativity, equipment design, fearless speech, the role of the city and agonistic discourse are all discussed in the book that I'm putting together. Um, uh, but put more simply, artists working with interrogative design employ the techniques of product design and performance to disrupt the status quo, provoking new ideas and conversations around topics essential to thriving democracies. Interrogative design interrupts the public and gives them new symbolic and cognitive tools to consider complex problems. It focuses on important social problems, ex exposing the issues to vivid public debate. Um, interrogative design, uh, this is an, another uh, quote uh, from Christoph. Um, uh, interrogative design questions the very worlds of needs of which it is born. Uh, it responds interrogatively to the needs that should not, but unfortunately do exist in the present civilized, in quotes, world. Uh, it is the unacceptable world. In the unacceptable world, interrogative design should present itself and be perceived as unacceptable. Interrogative design holds up a lens 
to issues of injustice. This is now my words. Interactive design holds up a lens to uh, issues of injustice and uh, if effective, should make itself obsolete. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I could, I could keep reading, but I think, um, I think I'll just stop there and I'm gonna start flipping through some slides. So I'll give you some more um, uh, fun things to look at. Uh, we already sort of touched on this question of what interrogative design is. Um, beyond what I've already mentioned, uh, in Vodichko's own words, he describes it in this two-page essay from 94, which is available online. You can read it yourself. It only really begins to get into what interrogative design is all about, but it's a, a very interesting essay. Now, the book that I'm putting together is going to include a lot of commentary from other people uh, in the margins um, to provide some counterpoints to what he's writing and what other people are writing on these topics. Uh, but interrogative design, here's, uh, I just, um, as in the process of writing the book, I've sort of uh, distilled it down to a, a variety of, uh, of topics that uh, distinguish interrogative design from other forms of design, specifically like um, speculative design or, or critical design more generally. Um, interrogative design is a very kind of particular way of approaching uh, art, and design, art and design. So um, I've already mentioned sort of quite question producing, you know, uh, projects which are more focused not on uh, solving a design problem, but creating new questions out of a design problem. Uh, often, uh, given the complexity of the issues facing us, um, designers rush to immediately produce things that solve uh, uh, some, some given problem. Uh, but interrogative design um, gives us a, a means for suspending that kind of the research moment of the design process and just staying in it and producing works around question making. Um, how, can you, how can you design something that will introduce new questions and help new questions be produced in the public that, that views your work? Um, interrogative design is participatory. Uh, so typically uh, the design process involves other, other people in the making of things. Um, it involves, uh, it happens uh, typically in public. So there's a there's a kind of a blended um, difference, uh, a blended uh, sorry sphere, I guess, uh, from from the inner sphere to the outer sphere of people who are involved in the project um, as as co-creators and as and uh, as the public of the work. Um, agonistic, so um, really, they're projects that are interested in not so much consensus building, but but creating some strong opinion uh, in public space uh, as a point or counterpoint to some debate. Um, so uh, uh, there's that and, and that goes hand in hand with Foucault's idea of fearless speech um, as critical to democracy that, that as an artist or as a user of one of these communicative instruments that interrogative designers create, uh, you can be a fearless speaker in public space where you can say uh, what others are thinking. You can take a risk uh, and, and speak out as uh, on a topic um, and how that is a, a critical component to um, a healthy democracy. Um, there's a therapeutic element to the works. Um, a lot of them, as uh, I'm not sure if I'll get to later, but a lot of the works um, show uh, uh, involve uh, people who have uh, gone through uh, a variety of different adversities and use the works as a part of a storytelling uh, and healing process for, for themselves. Um, also, interrogative design is really focused, uh, and this is part of the difference between interrogative design and speculative design. Uh, interrogative design is much more focused on um, the present moment um, and issues that are currently real and, and focused on the now, whereas speculative design has more of a, um, a science fiction kind of uh, element to it, where it's kind of really extrapolating out into the future about what could be. 
Um, and also interrogative design is performative. There's a there's a embodied kind of presence about it. Uh, often the the artist or the users of the work are are taking on some persona or uh, be it their own persona uh, or others and and enacting something in public space. Um, and prosthetics, prosthetics are a very important um, way of thinking about interrogative design, um, which you probably won't get into, but uh, it's uh, it's part of the uh, the larger picture of this. Um, let's let's get you to um, let's get you to some images so we can look at this. Um, participation is uh, I think we'll. We'll just look at the participation section and then I'll open this up to questions. Um, <clears throat> but one of the distinguishing key distinguishing features between interrogative design and speculative design is that interrogative design really involves communities of people right from the very beginning of the design process through to the end where it's uh, the artworks are experienced in public space. Um, Vodichko calls his process um, the inner public where his artwork will, um, his projects um, will start with uh, presenting a proposal to an institution, then forming uh, within uh, say like an art institution, some connections to other organizations. So for example, uh, the one project, which I think I'm gonna show later, he, um, he made a connection to, uh, an arts organization in Tijuana, and uh, and that arts organization then brought in um, other local organizations to collaborate with on his project. Uh, a few key people were um, selected as as mediators of people who would um, work with him very closely to mediate between his intentions uh, as an artist and the requirements of the institutions and uh, the participants that would um, be brought in. Um, the project is presented to participants. Um, it goes through some critical rounds of, of criticism and testing uh, where really the artist has to uh, survive some, some level of, um, of, uh, of uh, cr basically criticism and testing to know whether or not, uh, the, for the participants to know whether or not they can can really um, rely on the artist to tell their story through the work. Um, then there are a variety of workshops where, uh, much like a documentary uh, film producer, um, the participants start to tell the stories of their lived experiences. Um, and as the process itself begins to build more trust, more, more participants are brought in, are invited in by other participants who say, you know, hey, something good is going on here. Uh, and eventually, uh, a collective, a collab, the work is is created uh, collaboratively, um, guided by the artist and the mediators and the institution and the participants, and presented to an outer public. And that's roughly what this diagram here represents. You have this kind of uh, the inner public, uh, which is made up of the primary team of the artist and mediators, the participants who are um, who have come from the outside to tell their stories to form the uh, you know I guess you would call it the content of the work um, although it really is the the core of the work um, and then uh, they'll they often at this at this kind of in incubation stage of a project it en ends up involving a lot of other people who are connected to those those two groups including the spouses of participants friends lawyers who are involved psychotherapists production crews and others. So that inner public becomes, that that uh, all of these people become kind of sort of this initial public group that once um, once the project is presented, um, uh, they, they then become, uh, in, in a way, kind of spokespeople or mediators uh, between uh, a completely green uh, and, and fresh and uh, unknown public to the work itself. So uh, participation is interesting. It's an interesting topic. And uh, often in, in media art, uh, we encounter public participation in the form of crowd uh, sourcing uh, or simply involving uh, anonymous users in the projects. Uh, this is one of uh, Vodichko's students who's, uh, 
um, or name, name is uh, Orkan Telan, and he did a public work uh, in Istanbul with a video screen where he uh, posed a variety of um, public questions for people to respond to on their phones and vote on a variety of questions um, relating to uh, Turkish democracy at that time. Um, or, um, and that, uh, so that this is a kind of a media art that involves crowdsourcing. It's not quite the same process that uh, Vodichko uses, but we can start to think about these two things as um, as two different data points in in the process of of any participatory art or design work. Stand by you is another project um, by uh, a group called the Ad Oil um, uh, team. Um, it was a, a collective of artists in Hong Kong and uh, during the um, umbrella movement protests uh, installed a. Uh, uh, a projector on the side of, I believe this is the legislative building, uh, where they projected a Twitter, uh, a Twitter feed uh, for the protesters to see. So creating a, a, a link between the outside world and the, the um, public space of the protest. Um, another one of uh, Vodichko's students, uh, I should note that Ad Oil is not uh, one of Christoph's students, but uh, but sort of aligns in this thinking of participation in, in public art. Um, one of his students, uh, uh, Matthew Mazzotta, um did this work, and this is, I think, the last project which I'll show before we um, open it up to questions. But this, um, this is a project in uh, a small town in Alabama, and he uses a a process in his work, in his projects, um, most of which are public artworks uh, that he calls the, um, the outdoor living room. Right at the beginning of his uh, process, when he starts at a new site, um, he'll work with his arts organization to invite local community members to sit in an outdoor constructed living room. So he'll, he'll find used furniture or people will donate furniture and he'll sort of construct a living room out in a public space. And the arts organization helps facilitate inviting members of the community to sit, have some tea, chat, um, talk about um, what, uh, you know, what's going, what's going on for them, what's, what's, what are important issues in the community. At this point as an artist, he doesn't know what his intervention is gonna be. He doesn't know what he's gonna design um, in the, in the city yet. So he makes several visits, or it's not even a city, it's a small town. He makes small, a few visits, it has some of these sessions, it starts to build up some relationships and some concepts for what he might do. Um, what he ended up doing was he found uh, that this town um, was uh, very economically depressed. There were non, a number of uh, houses which were falling into disrepair. Um, and this one in particular, he, um, he found very interesting, or he, um, he kind of uh, had kind of focused on this one and um, got permission to, uh, to use the lot to disassemble the house and to create something new. Uh, and that was uh, this. So he basically used a lot of the recycled materials from the teardown of this house to create this house. A smaller house. Uh, some of the materials are familiar, um, but um, the, it uh, it actually has a function that's uh, somewhat unexpected. Um, a lot of uh, it's built on hinges, and it actually unfolds into a public uh, theater space, a public seating area that can be used for public events and seat and and uh, and theater and music events. Kind of like this. So the um, it has. Uh, the form of, of the object which used to be there, of the building that used to be there, but has a new function uh, to work as a community space, um, which uh, comes alive from time to time with community events, um, music, uh, theater, and uh, events like that. Uh, and it's received some press attention um, 
interesting to to think about the press attention of a project like this compared to um, uh, the uh, other press attention of the other projects. Um, and I think that's about it. I mean, I, we we're at I think around forty five minutes, so I'll probably just stop it there. There's a lot more content, and uh, I'd be curious to hear what questions you might have, and and uh, happy to answer any. Uh, that was great. Uh, <clears throat> so do you, yeah. do you have, Corey, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, I think the, I, this idea is definitely, it's really interesting to me, especially as a design student learning that, you know, everything that we do is not art and it's rather for, you know, providing solutions for a problem. Um, and you kind of, I kind of saw on like a slide that you had, what is designing without solutions? Um, I guess I would ask like, do you feel that, <clears throat> it seems to me that um, interrogative design is, it's mostly like used as a, a vehicle for discourse and, you know, bringing um, light to social issues, not necessarily providing solutions. Um, at the start of, you know, an interrogative design project, do you feel that the, the artist or um, the designer who comes up with an idea has certain goals that they want the, the project to accomplish in mind? Or do you feel that the goals are somewhat always evolving throughout the, pro the process? Um, to kind of talk about that. Sure, yeah, I mean, I get the sense that uh... Uh, overall, the goals tend to be some kind of improvement of um, an environment or a set of conditions or some social issue problem that's going on. Uh, typically, a lot of these projects um, sort of focus in on, on one area of concern or particularly like a community of, um, that uh, needs some kind of that could use some help or some some way out of a, a, a bind, I guess. Um, so it the goals are very similar to uh, that of public service, um, similarly motivated, but from more from an aesthetic, artistic design point of view, kind of using using those skills to provide new ways of looking at. At, at problems or, or uh, helping to reconfigure a community or to provide a, a, a way to communicate in it, a me like a, a new communication medium, basically, right? So we have, you know, we have Facebook, we have texting, you know, we have all these major platforms, but uh, artists and designers can create new kinds of platforms, new media um, that function in different ways that have different, um, uh, politics or um, requirements uh, connected to them um, that function, you know, Facebook is there primarily to draw your attention and sell you ads. Um, but, you know, what would a Facebook look like if it were a Facebook for, you know, a, the three block radius around where you live? It would look different. Um. Thanks for the thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I wanted to. I was wondering, are there any examples you know of of a interrogative design project going wrong or not being well received by the community where it was sort of set up in, or something like that? Um, there probably are. That's a good question. Um, I have a number of projects which haven't made it off the shelf. Um, so it, I think it depends on the, um, on the project and certainly, uh, some, a lot of projects take time. Um, you know, there, there are artists like, uh, like the late Christo and Jean-Claude who were, who planned public artworks for decades before they're made. And it requires a long-term process. Um, so I think failure is part of the process for sure. Um, 
Um, I guess yeah. another way of framing that is like, to what degree um, does conflict emerge in some of these projects in ways that aren't sort of uh, generative, you know, like in the way, like, you know, that, that actually kind of, uh, you know, uh, end up being really problematic. Right, because yeah. like the you you the the first project that you you showed right the the homeless uh, vehicle, right? Yeah. I mean that sort of confrontational, most definitely. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that that's actually one of the things that you know that that's a I indicative of its its kind of strength as a project, right? Is yeah. Um, it's, but it's, I mean, it's strong in the sense, but it's because it got built and it was used and it was adopted by some, some people to, to take on as theirs. So, you know, you could imagine probably all of the um, friction that, that happened along the way in the building of a project like that. And it could have, the project could have stopped at any point um, because of the pushback, you know, from people like Eric, Eric Roth or the, you know, the, the homeless uh, users who didn't trust the proce process, you know, uh, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's sort of. So uh, I have a question an part of the, process. the argument that you're developing in your book, which is, are you are you trying to make a broader art? Are, are, are you trying to persuade the, a kind of uh, a wider sort of design and technology sort of audience to think about the, their methods, to think about how how they're working? Um, or are you trying to sort of theorize, um, a, you know, a, per, a particular body of work and sort of situate what that work is and how, you know, how we should understand it? Or is it is is there it's, it's kind of both going on? Well, it's it's mostly the latter, but uh, you know, as models are useful for for modeling. So um, the idea is that it's partially a historical document, um, and uh, and some documentation of departures from this idea um, to give a sense for people who are working. Uh, so for te technology designers, for example. Uh, who want to think about, uh, you know, they might take a project that they're working on and sort of run it through the, the, the stream of the book and think, okay, well, uh, am I, is there anything from the book that I can glean from, from it to, to modify what I'm doing? So for example, like a lot of, um, a lot of technology projects, apps in general, just don't have any sense of public space. The, it's like, uh, it's like we've all kind of um, adopted this uh, idea that anything that's online is public, which is, I think, very uh, arguable. You know, like we've we've adopted Facebook and Twitter as public spaces, mm, but they're not really public spaces. Um, so, you know, if there was one thing, for example, that I'd encourage technology designers to think about or to take from the book, it would be like, don't forget public space. Public space is very important. These are spaces um, in the city that anyone has access to, costs nothing. There's a certain level of anonymity, certain level of familiarity. You know, it's always recombining. It's contentious. You know, um, no one, it's sort of owned, sort of un, not owned. There's always some kind of friction or conflict involved. Um, so it's not as smooth sailing as, uh, you know, I'll just create a Facebook group, you know. So I would encourage technology designers to think about uh, returning to public space as an important part of what they do. Because I think technology has really pulled a lot of life out of public space. And I think it's time for uh, some of that life to get to go back into public space. That's interesting to think about because like, it seems like a very tough problem to solve to me because, uh, you know, like public space ha has existed as long as humans have, but like tech, like virtual spaces are like created and maintained by some certain organization and, and can't exist without them. So it seems like it's very tough to do that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not, uh, it's not simple for sure. I, 
think that you know what makes a, pub, a space public is that it's has a kind of this element of being owned by everybody. So public spaces, and it's different in the U.S. and from Canada, but uh, you know if the city if the city maintains a public space, a park, a sidewalk, you know, a setback from a from from the street. Uh, uh, those those are spaces that uh, that anyone can participate in and, and use to some extent. Um, so uh, these are these are spaces which everyone has the right to be in and to do things in. And uh, you know one of the things that I like about interrogative design is it often calls to attention a lot of the unwritten rules of public space. There are a lot of assumptions, there are a lot of um, kind of codes of behavior that are written into a culture and into a society. And the role of uh, artists and designers is really to hack that stuff and for the, for the, for the public good. Um, see how we can kind of modify that um, to make things a little better for everyone else. I guess kind of going off of that, you kind of talked about what I was going to ask about, which is awesome. But um, touching on like, like a physical project, like the first one you talked about, like that actually has a um, like tangible, like feelable um, like product to it um, versus like software, what are like when, related to interrogative design, what are some like advantages of software or disadvantages versus um, like a physical object? Right. Um, so I guess software, um, uh, software is easier to change. It's more malleable, right? Um, in a lot of ways, it's more dynamic. It's less fixed and finished. Uh, that can be both uh, positive and negative, depending on um, what you're trying to achieve. Um, but uh, yeah, like one of the great things that you can do with software is you can make uh, variations. You can do A-B split testing very easily, which you couldn't do quite as quickly with uh, physical hardware. Um, it's less visible, it has less presence, you know, so that's kind of a downside. It really depends on what sort of sensors and actuators you start to use. If you know, if this is is this software for a phone? Is this software with uh, with a projector and uh, you know connect? That's a whole other thing. Um, it really depends on what you're building. Um, yeah. Uh, how how do these ideas um, relate to uh, your your startup project that that you're doing? You're working on in the garage. Like, do you, do you do you feel like they're kind of related and inform? Does one inform the other to some degree? Can you t maybe introduce some of the work that you're some the uh, startup project that you're working on too? Uh, sure. Um, so the startup project that I'm doing is I'm creating an augmented reality uh, drawing tool, basically CAD for AR. Like if you would sketch up for AR. Okay, so if you're if you have something that you want to uh, design in 3D space, um, instead of sitting in your office and and using a mouse and your laptop to imagine what it might be, um, I think it's a lot more effective to take your phone, go on site and start drawing there, um, and have what you're drawing kind of be emerge in the in the space itself. So. What I'm creating is something called Graphite AR, which is a lightweight drawing tool uh, for augmented reality. And I mean, it's related in the sense, it, I'm looking at it as a kind of a general purpose tool. Uh, you can import some, some 3D models, you can export what you've drawn, uh, you can draw with other people, it's got a kind of multi-user functionality. Um, and uh, it's pretty basic at this point, but uh, it's related in the sense that uh, that it's a design tool that doesn't exist right now, which I'd like to be able to use, but uh, it has a collaborative component. It has a participatory component. Um, and philosophically, it's based on the idea that really more things should be malleable. And this is really the problem with technology is we have this, um, 
the sort of we've had for a long time the rhetoric around technology that it's democratizing that it's going to change the world for the better and that sort of thing but there's a massive shearing layer between uh, the people who know how to change uh, technology how to how to modify technology and the people who use it um, and it's really a black box uh, you have to you have to tune up your skills in order to be able to change things and a lot of projects arduino and other things that try to make it easier for for people to code uh, and and create technology but still um, uh, Anyway, philosophically, I just it, the idea is that it's modifiable. So in a way, it's kind of like a um, taking the idea that uh, that uh, yeah, you should it should be easier to modify public space or your own space through tools like this. Yeah, interesting. Uh, any other questions? We got some good questions there earlier. Um, Oh, that's my dog barking. Well, I'm going to mute myself for a second. Excuse me. Do you feel like um, the the um, the process, design process um, of interrogative design is iterative? Like, do you feel like the work continues past um, public reception and everything with the project? Or do you think that the work continues in the discourse that follows? Um, both, yeah, both of those things. I think most of these examples of interrogative design, the projects typically they're presented publicly and then they're taken down they exist temporarily, there's some documentation of it. Then the work really exists in the memories of people who've seen it and a few photographs, maybe a publication or two. And then it becomes, like you say, it's kind of a discursive thing. It becomes a, a story about a project. Um, but a lot of these artists will restage the same project or similar projects in other places. Sure, but yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's not really a question, but it sort of reminds me of um, just kind of relevant right now is the Waldorf Hotel with Banksy and um, like he created, are you familiar? Um, the hotel? No, I'm, I'm familiar with Banksy roughly, but basically uh, it was a, it was intended to be temporary, but it's become permanent. It's a hotel um, in Bethlehem along the, uh, believe it's the West Bank wall. Um, and it was sort of calling attention to um, the struggle of the Palestinian people. And it was also done as like, um, like a hundred year anniversary um, of the signing of the, the Balfour Declaration. Um, but uh, the, the public perception was definitely mixed like with some people saying it was anti-semitic and also um people kind of saying that he was uh creating kind of like trauma tourism with like i think about 140,000 visitors have visited this and stayed in the hotel in palestine hmm. but it's definitely like a polarizing work of art and it's also a physical location that can be visited so hmm. uh, definitely reminded me of some of his work. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think the term trauma tourism is probably a, is an interesting thing to think about. Where's the line between an artist uh, helping and taking advantage? Uh, yeah, um, interesting. I'll, I'll have to have a look at it. Um, but yeah, artists are not social workers. So they, uh, and designers are not social workers. They work in a very different way. So there's certainly um, possibility for artists intervening in, um, you know, contentious environments or um, in various populations to cause harm. And certainly artists and artistic research is not, doesn't tend to have any like ethical review boards or, you know, do no harm uh, mottos. Um, so, um, um, 
Yeah, that's a good question. Good, good point. Um, I'll have to look that up. Hmm. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to the book. It, it sounds like well, there's going to be some interesting projects in there to to look at and think about. Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, when when do you hope to have it done by? What's your timeline? Um, it should be uh, handed off. Uh, I think it'll be ready for sale probably next fall. Um, yeah, I think that's what we're we're aiming for. And uh, uh, I've never written a book before, so who knows what'll actually happen. But uh, I think it's in it's in relatively good shape. We've got a lot of good contributors who are very excited about it. A uh, mm. number of people who are. Uh, you know, reprinted texts, which are really interesting that have, that have uh, handed off copyright to us already. And, uh, and uh, yeah, MIT Press seems to be pretty uh, uh, jazzed about publishing it. And, uh, and uh, I keep getting feedback from, from people in the periphery of interrogative design saying that it's a very needed and timely, um, timely project. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to uh, getting it out there. Yeah. All right. Well, definitely let us know. Keep, you know, send send some updates, and we'll I'll let everybody know that the book is out once it's released. So. Cool. Well, thanks. Uh, it was nice uh, speaking to your class, and all the best with the hopefully not so much remaining time with the pandemic, and uh, uh, have a have a great rest of your week, guys. All right. Well, toodaloo, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.